So I think reality TV can sometimes get a bad rap. It's known as the lowest common denominator entertainment, lazy, cheap, exploitative. So I want to be clear that the show I'm going to tell you guys about, it's all of those things. But what makes this the worst reality show of all time is that it just fails on every imaginable level. Like the only explanation I have for how a show could fail this horribly is that maybe one of the producers like crossed an old fortune teller woman at a local fairground and was cursed for a thousand years. The product that was planned was extremely poor, but then also nothing went according to plan. It was a liability nightmare, a total bloodbath, just this poorly designed and pointless competition of untested games that even nature itself seemed pitted against. I'm Luke Tipple. This is Opposite World. Remember that when they were marketing Opposite Worlds, they tried to play it up as more than a reality show, like it was some kind of experiment. This series originally aired on Sci-Fi Channel, so they were very much like, this isn't some dumb baby reality show, this is an academic endeavor. The conceit of this show is that they built a house, and it's split down the middle by a pane of glass, one half represents the future, and one half represents the distant past. So basically like caveman times. The contestants are split randomly into two teams. Epoch goes to the past and Kronos starts in the future. They don't explain the rationale for who starts where. It's just kind of a luck of the draw thing, I think. The ideas we're going to learn from this series. What kind of human is in peak performance? A caveman from the past? or a brainiac person from the future. I'm hoping that alarm bells are already going off in your head for why this does not make any sense as a setup. The team that's living in the cave, they didn't grow up as cavemen and vice versa. So if the idea is that a caveman would be especially fit from their life of hard survival, or a future person would be genetically engineered or have some kind of intellectual advantage, these are just normal people in a house. I mean, it already goes without saying that the future house isn't that futuristic. It's just kind of expensive current tech. They couldn't go into the future. They don't get around with jetpacks or eat vitamin pills or whatever. So with this in mind, the game is just kind of obscenely stacked in favor of the team that's in the future. It's not like each side of the house has its own unique advantages and disadvantages. It's just like, yep, one team is clean and well-rested and well-nourished and the other side is eating raw vegetables and sleeping on the ground in the freezing cold. And yes, it's cold. How do you feel? Uh, cold. I told you this show failed at every level. So the producers of this series made the call to film in January, just outside of New Orleans. Not only because it's super cheap to film there, but because they anticipated warm weather at that time of year, even more so than in LA. You know, it's a trashy reality show. They wanted all their sexy young contestants to like take their clothes off and go hot tubbing and stuff like that. Unfortunately, this production was cursed for a thousand years. So that particular winter, New Orleans was experiencing a really harsh, cold snap. A lot of the days when they were filming this show, the high temperature was like 30 degrees, 40 degrees. Not a big deal, except the past side of the house is an uninsulated lean-to of sticks and rocks. We're freezing cold. It's a little cold over there. Oh my goodness, it is cold over here. It's freezing cold in here. Oh, I'm so cold. I'm freezing. Freezing. I'm just shivering. To add insult to injury, the producers of the show put all the ladies in the past side in these like sexy fur bikinis. Which, I guess that would be fun in the summertime, but you can see them visibly shivering. I'm like really, really cold. Oh, yeah. My toes are going numb. The shower is an unheated spigot stuck into one of the walls. They were provided materials to build a fire, but the damp winter weather made it all moist, so they couldn't do anything with it. It would be nicer if we had a fire going. Somebody build a damn fire right now. Because of the weather, our fire starting kindling was too moist. We can't start a fire, so it sucks. So according to the rules, every even numbered week, they have a live elimination round, and every odd numbered week, they have a team challenge to determine 
which team gets to pick which side of the house they're going back to. It's phrased like that, like, you get to choose, but obviously the winning team picks future every single time. Anyway, in theory, this works pretty well because it gives you extra incentive to function as a team, and then you're gonna wanna send your weakest players in for the elimination rounds to keep your team strong and try to get the good side of the house. But Team Epoch, they started in the past. They're so cold, they're not getting any sleep at night. For food, they're being given things like buckets of fish heads. Why wouldn't they get the whole fish? They had a whole fish in the past. They give them cold, raw vegetables that they could cook if they could start a fire. We're eating stale bread and carrots, and we don't even care anymore because we're so cold. Despite the conceit of the show, pretty much every challenge is extremely physical, and Epoch's going in weak and worn down and exhausted. This competition lasted for 12 weeks, and Team Epoch started in the past and lost for seven weeks in a row. So every week they're going back to the past house, just getting progressively more miserable and haggard as time goes on and widening the gap between the two teams. You guys living in the past, you guys really haven't eaten much at all. So let me give you a rundown of the characters in this show that matter. The host, Luke Tipple, looks like a generic dreamboat actor, but he identifies himself extremely vaguely as a scientist. My name is Luke Tipple. I'm a scientist, an adventurer, and for the next six weeks, I'll be leading you on what will be a perilous journey through time. That's how I always introduce myself, too. I guess Luke Tipple originated from Shark Week programming? So I'm not doubting that he has a science degree, but from what I could find online, he's a marine biologist, and I don't know how that qualifies him to host whatever this is. Like I said, every even-numbered week is a live elimination round, and I love watching Luke Tipple struggle to fill the airtime with awkward small talk and jokes that don't land. That's a bit of a David and Goliath thing you guys have got going here, huh? Yeah. Okay, victory and defeat, they're really just two sides of the same coin. Maybe opposite sides of a glass wall, if you will. Frank, you'll have to go after her. That's it. All right. On Team Kronos, we have Jeffrey. Jeffrey thinks he is this genius mastermind playing everybody in the game. Right now, me and JR are in a secret alliance. You know, nobody knows about this. But he is very much not that. Huh? I don't trust his gameplay, bottom line. I don't. He's constantly trying to do things that he thinks are duplicitous and clever, but everyone on both teams just sees all the way through him. He just kind of succeeds in making everyone hate him, and then gets really upset about it when he finds out. I just, I don't, I don't know why Barry just says that out the worst. <sighs> okay, mate, well. Frank. As soon as I saw Frank, I identified him as a minotaur. This man has biceps three times the size of his head and the most triangular torso I've ever seen on a human. He's just a big, dumb, lumbering, smiley, well-meaning monster. I'm ready to go. It's, it's a dude or a girl. I'm ready. I'm always ready. That's what I live for. His job outside of the show is a firefighter, so even though I find him terrifying, at least he's putting it all to good use, you know. Rachel gets eliminated, like, right away, so she's not really notable, but I just wanted to mention her because she has pink hair and her occupation is listed as professional gamer, which I just thought was kind of funny. I realized that, I guess technically I'm like a YouTuber. So, glass houses. Opposite sides of a glass wall, if you will. Jesse looks like a rich guy that owns a boat and then he uses his boat as his workshop to kidnap people and cut them open and look at their insides, like, to amuse himself. On Team Epoch, in the past, we have JR. JR is like this nice, easily manipulated, good-looking southern boy, and he's the fan favorite most weeks, and I have to assume that's why. There are, like, three girls, and they're all varying shades of blonde and... They all seem cool, but I honestly can't tell them apart from each other very well. And Charles. I spent 18 years in the military. Between the Marine Corps, the Army, and National Guard, I have everything necessary to win the competition. He's ripped. He's a war veteran. Like, he's actually seen combat. As soon as you meet Charles, you're kind of like, okay, he's going to carry the rest of the team. Now, I'd like to talk about 
the challenges. The challenges are basically working off of the theme of has to do with time, but the producers of the show seem to only be able to think of medieval times, the Wild West, and ancient Egypt. And they just repeat those periods of time after they've already used them just because they can't think of anything else. 90% of the challenges are just straight up obstacle courses. They have one that tries to be the future where they're like driving a robot, but they're driving the robot through an obstacle course, so. But I'd like to tell you about the very first challenge of the entire show, week one. Keep in mind, these people have just arrived on the scene like yesterday. This is their intro to how the show is gonna go. This is the tone setter. There is a platform 10 feet in the air. Competitors from either team have to run up the ramp and attempt to knock their opponent off of the platform. Oh, also. Each one of you will be armed with one of these. Okay, each team sends in a girl. They fight it out, so far so good. Then it's time for each team to send in a guy. Kronos sends in Jesse, and Epoch sends in Charles. They run up the ramp, they square off. Jesse tackles Charles, and they both go over the side. <sighs> he is hurt, man. Yeah, that was he hurt. Get medics in place. They have safety cushions, but they're narrow, and they're placed in such a way that they assume that you're gonna just go to the edge and then gently fall straight down. Charles was pushed, so he falls 10 feet onto the ground below and completely misses the safety cushion. His leg is broke, dude. He horrifyingly shatters his leg, lies on the ground groaning in pain, and has to get taken away by an ambulance. So there goes Charles, that was Epoch's strongest competitor, and he's now been totally taken out of the competition by this dangerous cattle prod fight 10 feet in the air. But Luke Tipple tells us the show must go on. So, um, any volunteers? I bet everybody's really clamoring to go next. I mean, who would want to fall off of that platform? It's... I didn't want to break my neck. Fair enough. <laughs> Fair enough. He agreed with them. So eventually they get their two girls to go in for the next round. It, it all goes fine. Epoch even wins this time, which is awesome. But... Lauren, bring it up home for your team! Teams, Lauren has injured her finger and is currently with a medic. Oh my god. But hey, the good news is Lauren gets to see Charles while she's at the hospital. I went and saw Charles. Oh, oh. Was he? That was really bad. Yikes. So if you couldn't tell, uh, this is my next point about the show being cursed, is that this show has so many injuries. In the same episode, you even have another guy from Team Epoch who like gets his fingers all sliced up when he's trying to build a fire. Look, I'm just saying, there are a lot of stupid reality shows and most of them involve dangerous things and crazy obstacle courses. I have never heard of this many people getting injured on a single season of a show. Literally none of these challenges feel like they were play tested, not only for safety, but even just to like test their viability as games. Not only did we lose the challenge, but we lost two of our players, Charles and Lauren, due to injury. It's looking pretty rough for Team Epoch, but hey, here's a pick me up. It's Charles! He's back for a visit, just hobbling in with a horrifying full leg cast. The whole scene of his visit is so awkward because it's just everyone trying to make conversation like, hey, are you feeling okay? And Charles is like, no, I'm not. I'm doing as well as I can. So Bro broken tibia. Oh. Yeah, two different places. What happens now? Do you have to have surgery? Yeah, I have to have surgery, yeah. How do you hey, feel man. about that, man? Man, I, I kind of feel bad. They all say how much they miss him and that they're going to fight extra hard on his behalf now. And it must be pretty cold comfort because he only knew these people for like a week. To lose him in this experience was, was terrible for me because that was my crutch. <laughs> Please don't say crutch. So they've paraded Charles out to show that there are no hard feelings, even though I'd imagine there probably are. And then he painstakingly crutches out of the shot and he's gone from the show forever. Let's jump to week three. Luke Tipple tells us that our friends at home have been voting online to pick a new competitor for each team. Team Kronos, I want you to welcome Mercy. Team Epoch, you're welcome Steve. So here comes Steve and Mercy. It's their very first week in the game. And the challenge for this week is... One player from each team will be tied to a rack by the opposing team. Each team has to pick a contestant to essentially be crucified in the middle of this field. That player will be safely hoisted up into the air. <laughs> can, I, can I just point out that they clearly dubbed the word safely in 
after the fact. That player will be safely hoisted up. In a totally stone cold move, both teams vote to put their newest contestant on the rack. Welcome to the team, you guys. Steve and Mercy are trying to be good sports about it. And our first impression of Steve is this very mysterious and very suggestive comment. I have a lot of friends that would love to see me tied up like that, so it's for them. Okay. To make it worse, their teammates have to race to untie them while members of the opposing team are pelting them with tomatoes. The purpose of the tomatoes is clearly to distract the people untying the knots, but for whatever reason they keep just lobbing them at the poor people tied spread eagle to a rack. Frank is in typical beast mode. He's throwing these tomatoes like 40 miles an hour. You can hear them making impact, and he hits poor Steve just square in the face. Oh, I'm over here, buddy, not over there. Steve, remember to duck your head into those, mate. Fortunately, Steve is wearing safety goggles. Unfortunately, this is opposite worlds, so the safety goggles are cheap and useless, and the impact of the tomato shoves the rim of the plastic into the skin of his face, slicing him open, making him bleed everywhere, and leaving him with a scar that doesn't go away the whole rest of his time on the show, and which, for all I know, is permanent for the rest of his life. Do reality shows just not get audited for workplace safety? Now let's look at my personal favorite game. I told you that from the beginning of this show, I had been referring to Frank as a scary minotaur. Well, week six, Team Epoch decides that they really need to take down Frank. He is their strongest competition. So they decide to send in their tiniest girl player, hoping she can get an edge on him in terms of speed and agility. We come up to challenge night, and surprise, surprise, it's another obstacle course. But this obstacle course contains a maze. They literally refer to this maze as a labyrinth. Frank, you must navigate through that labyrinth. To win this challenge, Frank needs to race through this labyrinth and chase down this much smaller girl and catch her before the time limit runs out. The funniest thing about this challenge is that Again, you can tell they didn't play test it to see if it would actually be evenly stacked between the two competitors. They start the clock and it takes Frank 12 seconds to catch Angela. flags over in 10 yeah. seconds it's, it's just a slaughter and considering how easy it was for him frank really rubs in how happy he is to have won for a comfortably long time Whoa! Whoa! this is one of the live challenges and since the challenge didn't come close to filling the allotted time luke tipple is forced to try to struggle to fill that airtime by basically just going up to angela and pointing out that she lost. Seemed like you were willing to give her all you could give. Yeah, that, that was over very quick. While she looks visibly irritated with him. Bonus points for his awkward goodbye to her. Good luck to you, Angela, but you are eliminated. Thanks. Week seven, they remind the contestants that they hate them by having a challenge where they dig through a giant mountain of horse manure to find explosive charges. But I really just wanted to mention week seven for this moment. JR, what happened to you, Matt? Uh, I was doing a little run in the cave last night and ended up spraying my ankle. This can't be normal. This is also the week that Team Epoch wins a challenge for the first time ever, and now, with the show almost over, gets to go to the future. They also get to steal a team member from Kronos, and they obviously pick Frank. I have to assume this rule where you get to steal a player was added on the fly after Epoch lost so many team members to eliminations and injuries. Every twist and turn and challenge in this show ranges from aggressively unpleasant to outright dangerous. I seriously can't imagine what kind of ironclad contract they had to keep these people living in miserable conditions and under the care of showrunners who probably meant well, but were demonstrably too stupid to keep these people safe. It's like a bunch of teenagers tried to make a reality show in their backyard. You know, we didn't safety test anything, but me and my buddies made a ramp out of plywood. Another particularly cruel element to the game dynamic is they're really trying to push the Twitter interactivity of this show, so they're constantly urging people to tweet their favorite players. The fan favorite character every week gets some kind of perk, like a spa day or a call home or an advantage in a game, and then the least favorite one gets punished. And this is so funny in like a dystopian way, 
if Twitter decides that you're the least favorite person, they literally just deprive you of food. You may not eat for 24 hours. Yeah, they just starve you. Now, let's talk outcomes of this academic endeavor. We get to the final episode and our players are Sam, JR, Jeffrey, and Frank. Twitter votes Frank as their favorite player that week, which means he gets to skip the semifinals. He gets to sit it out and just go straight to the final competition. This is pretty good news for Frank because the semifinals are the first intellectually based thing of the entire show. It's a trivia contest. And you're probably like, oh, it must be history trivia or stuff about new technology because, you know, that would make sense with the theme of the show. But no, it's just trivia about opposite worlds. After the worldly challenge where you had to dig for puzzle pieces in 15 tons of horse manure, which team's player was granted a reward for being at the top of the Twitter popularity index? It's like if in Slumdog Millionaire, instead of the questions tying into significant memories, they were just kind of like, what was your ex-girlfriend's name? JR wins, so the other two players have to go home. And since it's a live round, Luke Tipple handles it as awkwardly as he usually does. Okay, well, congratulations for making it this far, Thank but you. you have been eliminated. Awesome. You can leave. Good luck. Okay. Now you have been eliminated, and you have to leave right now. Thank you. Okay. Okay, final showdown. It's JR versus Frank. It's anyone's game. The first duel was all about brains, but to make it to the top of this competition, Literally, you'll need to rely on your brawn. Oh, well, it sounds like it's Frank's game. The final challenge is basically another obstacle course, because why not? This one is mostly oriented around scaling a tower. You know, that thing firefighters are trained to do. Frank starts hopping from platform to platform like an enraged Donkey Kong, and JR is kind of keeping pace. Maybe he can still take this. Oh, wait, nope, no, um, Frank beat him by, by like a mile. Frank! You are the first yes. Officer World Champion! Congratulations! All right, we have our winner and we'll talk yeah. to him. So, here's the thing. I already mentioned that Frank is a New York City firefighter and he says he has kids at home. I'm fine with my wife and kids. You know, I want to sell my kids college education. I am genuinely happy and satisfied that Frank won. He was always really upbeat and he got along with everybody and he was genuinely one of the most likable people on the show. I wasn't too happy about challenging Angela anyway. It was kind of sad. I felt bad for her. Whoa! Whoa! I felt bad for her. I don't think it's right for him to go out there and duel with his, you know, sprained ankle. So, um, he has the extra legs to help him out. I'm really a good, genuine guy, you know? Yeah, I'm competitive. But can I just point out how much Frank winning destroys the entire conceit of the show. Frank is a man who struggled with any remotely intellectually based challenge on the show and often struggles to put words together. I mean, if you're gonna play me in Sudoku, I'm not definitely winning that. He has the crazy ripped physique of a caveman, but he spent the first seven weeks of the show living in the future side of the house with Team Kronos. Then, coincidentally, he was switched to Team Epoch the very first week that they got to live in the future. Frank came in fitter than everybody else and then spent 10 of the 12 weeks living in luxury. He had the benefits of good nutrition and sleep and cleanliness on his side. The show pretended it was going to examine something about human performance and evolution, or past versus future, brains versus brawn, but instead every challenge was just a basic obstacle course where Frank's physical strength put him at a huge advantage. In the one challenge where he would have had to carry himself by the merit of his brains alone, he won the Twitter vote and he got to sit it out. Opposite Worlds ran for just one season, and in that time, it failed in every regard. It failed as a show, it failed as a game, it failed in its most basic obligation to keep its contestants safe. We learned nothing, and the guy who won, won because he was the biggest, beefiest bodybuilder there. The little guys had no chance, the girls had no chance, and to add insult to injury, Frank had pure dumb luck on his side every step of the way. The only takeaway you can really have from this is that success is the result of pure aggression and dumb luck. 
which I guess that's fine. So that was the story of the first and last season of Opposite Worlds, or I think it's the last one. The finale aired in early 2014, but the Wikipedia page is still in present tense, and the producers are not willing to admit anywhere that it was canceled. They actually made a casting call website for season two. They posted it like a month after the first season aired, and it is still active today. Like, I'm not saying go sign up to be on season two of Opposite Worlds because I don't want to be responsible for you dying, but, like, you could. I know that Charles is sitting at home watching this broadcast and we want you to know that everyone here sends you our best wishes. Good luck, mate.